Hello and welcome. Today we'll be taking a deep dive into the Trimoran vehicle playset from Kenner's 1995 Waterworld toy line, as well as a look behind the scenes of how that iconic piece of movie history was constructed and operated to create those unbelievable scenes in the film. Turning to his steering console, he threw levers that converted the ship into something quite unexpected. The egg beater sail folded into the mast, which extended to twice its height, and a boom appeared from out of the center hull's deck. Sails unfurled, jib, mainsail, mezzen, as the troller suddenly, almost magically, transformed itself into a sleek racing yacht. Welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. On this channel, we dive deep into everything Waterworld to make new discoveries about this cult sci-fi adventure franchise. This video will conclude my Kenner Waterworld toy reviews with a look at the spectacular and unique Trimoran playset, and all the details about the film's actual set piece that have found their way into the toy counterpart. Let's first take a look at the box that the playset came packaged in. The front of the box displays a beautifully rendered illustration of the toy in a semi-realistic action figure reality, with the Bola Attack Mariner and the Atoll Enforcer taking gunner stations on the deck of the ship. The front of the box also states the Trimoran's ability to convert to fast attack combat ship, as well as information on the impressive size of the toy. On the back of the box is the logo and a brief synopsis of the film. The back of the box also has a wonderful spread of photographs and text that detail the various action features incorporated into the toy. More on all these in just a moment. But let's first go back to the initial inception of the Trimoran set piece and how it came into existence. Concept artist Steve Berg's first task on the film was to come up with a quote, hero boat for the main character to inhabit. He initially toyed with the idea of a catamaran, a dual hold yacht, but ultimately went with the Trimoran for its stability and aesthetic possibilities. While flipping through a sailing magazine, Berg encountered a trimaran racing yacht created by the French company called Genot. The yacht was the fastest in its class and intended for transatlantic open ocean racing. The 60 by 45 foot boat was both powerful and exotic, the perfect hero boat for Waterworld, and moreover, Genot agreed to come on as full collaborators with the Waterworld film crew. However, the Genot racing yacht would undergo major modifications to bring it into the Waterworld universe. Similar to the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars, the production designers wanted the Trimoran to be futuristic looking while also being aged by centuries at sea. Furthermore, Dennis Gassner, lead production designer on the film, wanted to show visually the down and dirty ingenuity of the Mariner through the design of the boat. This would be accomplished through its incredible transformation ability. The Mariner is a tinkerer by nature, so it's only fitting that he would be constantly modifying his vessel and home to best fit his lifestyle. It was determined that the Trimoran would have two different modes, a utilitarian trolling mode and a high-powered escape mode. In the trolling mode, the Trimoran used an egg beater style windmill that would run a propeller that allowed the vessel to dredge the bottom of the ocean for treasures under peaceful circumstances. In the high powered escape mode, the Trimoran would convert to a sleek sailboat that can outrun even the fastest of the smoker's armada. It was decided by the design team that two trimorans would be created to accomplish the job, one for the trolling mode and the transformation sequence, and one purely for the sailing scenes. 
Each of the boats cost over a million dollars apiece. Much of the construction of the ships was completed in France by the Junot team. Under normal conditions, the boats would have been transported to the film set on the deck of a freighter, but given the constraints of the filming schedule, the two custom-made trimarans were loaded onto 747 air freighters with barely an inch to spare and sent to location on Hawaii's Big Island. And, like the actual trimaran stowed into the body of a 747, the toy trimaran playset is neatly packed into the box packaging. The trimaran includes directions for assembly which is fairly straightforward besides the net decking, which is extremely tedious to attach and get situated perfectly square between the pontoons. Once assembled, the trimaran is truly an impressive toy. Sculpted into each piece of the playset are fantastic details like rust, eroded fiberglass, sailing cleats, and even rope. At the stern of the craft is the electric-powered winch that the mariner used to dredge the bottom of the ocean while in trolling mode. And speaking of trolling mode, the trimaran playset sports a rotating windmill with three rotor blades. In the film, the actual rotor blades were very tricky to engineer. The 25-foot blade spun at approximately 15 revolutions per minute. A composite engineer created the blades from a heat-cured, high-grade epoxy fiberglass that provided lightness, strength, and flexibility. The rotation of the blades was controlled by two hydraulic motors mounted at the top and bottom of the rig, and which used computerized motion controls to synchronize the starting up and stopping of the rotation. Turning our focus back to the playset, we find the iconic control stand. The Mariner figure stands proudly at the command post with the figure's hands fitting nicely onto the hand grips, and the control stand really serves as this nice helm for the figure to command the playset from. In the film, the trimaran control stand contained levers, switches, and levers that would steer the craft and trim the sails and set off a series of counterweights that would transform the boat from trolling to sailing mode. However, in truth, the control stand was purely a prop for actor Kevin Costner to act alongside. Let's now get into the specifics of the Trimaran transformation, which was inspired by the Japanese Transformer toys and the Swiss Family Robinson. The transformation breaks into three stages that happen in rapid succession. 1. The windmill folds in. 2. The mast extends. And 3. The boom and the sail lift out of the deck. In the film, the entire effect appears to happen in a matter of 10 seconds, however, in reality, it required considerable more time and effort. The production designers were careful to create rotor blades that were strong enough to freely spin but flexible enough to fold into the mast. With the windmill folded, a hydraulic motor and drum pulled the telescoping mast upwards 30 feet to a total height of 85 feet. As the mast was pulled up, so was the main halyard, which subsequently pulls the boom in the main sail out of a spring-loaded hatch built into the deck. The boom was constructed of four telescoping pieces of hand-bent aluminum that extended to 30 feet while carrying the sail along with it. The trimaran playset follows the same sequence for its own transformation. The windmill folds in and clips to the bottom of the mast. The mast extends upwards to an impressive 21 inches. From the center pontoon, a hatch on the deck flips open to expose a compartment that contains the boom and sail which can be pulled out and attached to the top of the mast. The trimaran is now in its sailing mode. In the film, the sails of the trimaran, despite appearing to be made of patchwork fabrics, were actually fashioned from high-strength spectra, a synthetic material three times the strength of nylon. The sails were actually hand-painted to appear weathered and assembled from found materials. The deck netting was also constructed of spectra, giving the cast and crew a solid surface to work on. Looking at the underside of the trimaran playset, we find dual wheels on the center pontoon. 
allowing the craft to glide on smooth surfaces and floors. The movie version of the Mariner's Trimaran was able to glide across the surface of the ocean thanks to a hidden crew of professional sailors. Since the script called for many fast passes and helicopter shots, it was necessary that the crew not be on the deck so that the Mariner could appear to be operating the boat solo. The engineers, as you know, devised a way of controlling the sails, the steering, and the communication from inside the boat's hulls, with television monitors giving the crew a visual window to the outside, and joysticks controlling the boat's independent hydraulic systems. Unfortunately for the sailing crew of the Trimaran, to cut back on the overall weight of the boat, air conditioning units were removed from below deck. The on-screen below deck presented in the film was actually an interior set built on the mainland. Set decorator Nancy Hay decided the interior of the Trimaran would be a workspace from where the Mariner would tinker with his inventions, filling the set with future age tools and items he would find at the bottom of the sea. The playset also includes, quote, rigging, or the string that allows you to swing the mariner about the boat or soar to the top of the mast, like in the film. The mast also includes a cross tree which keeps the boat's stays balanced and organized. It also allows you to reenact my favorite shot from the film. No other shot in the film better represents the hugeness of the ocean or the solitude of the mariner. However, during the filming of the shot, a gust of wind came up, causing the ship to go much faster than intended, with Kevin Costner still attached to the top of the mast. The crew had to actually sail the ship to the leeward side of the island before they could bring the Hollywood star back down to deck level. The playset has three separate gunner stations, one on either side pontoon and one at the very bow of the boat. The two side stations are spring-loaded projectile spear guns with very nice handholds to push down to launch the spear. The projectiles and the shooters are wonderfully sculpted, seemingly lashed together from salvaged parts. The station at the bow is a large crossbow that rotates atop a pedestal. However, you may be asking yourself why the toy designer chose to change the bow gun station from a harpoon in the film to a crossbow on the toy, or why the side stations were added which are not present in the movie. I believe the answer lies in the concept art for the film. Closely studying this piece of Trimaran concept art, we do in fact find two spear guns on the outside pontoons of the boat and it is my belief that the idea for the bow-mounted crossbow may have come from early concept art of the Ds, just given how similar the designs are. But where else can we find the Trimaran in the Waterworld Expanded Universe? Well, the Trimaran, being an iconic part of the film, is seen in a variety of product tie-ins, from the pinball game to the board game, as well as the Game Boy game, the Super NES game, the Virtual Boy game, and the Sega Genesis game. The Mariner also has two other versions of the Trimaran after the original is destroyed by the Deacon and his smokers. At the end of the film, the Mariner departs from dry land aboard a wooden catamaran. And in the comics, which happen sequentially after the events of the film, the Mariner has a reimagined Trimaran that is modeled after a jet fighter. This version of the Trimaran has a few unique adaptations that take concepts put forth in the film to the next level, like a deployable air balloon. But where is the actual on-screen Trimaran presently? While I'm unable to find super current or accurate information, it appears that the trolling transforming trimaran has been refitted into a racing yacht and is currently docked in San Diego, going by the name of Low Real. And the sailing trimaran is now on display in a lagoon at Universal Studios Florida. If you have more information about the current whereabouts of the trimaran, please drop a line in the comments down below. 
Well, there you have it. That's my in-depth analysis of the Kenner Trimaran playset and the workings of the actual on-screen set piece. This also concludes my collection of in-depth reviews of the entire Kenner Waterworld toy line, so if you haven't already, be sure to go back and check out the other videos on this channel. And thanks, as always, for joining me at The A-Toll.